Hello, we're back with Chapter 5 of The Indian in the Cupboard by Lynn Reed Banks. So settle down, settle in. Let's begin Chapter 5 called Tommy. Omri felt himself grow weak. What an idiot he'd been not to have realized that the man uh, and not just the medical bag would be changed. Or had he? After all, what did he need more than just a bandage of the right size for the Indian? Someone of the right size to put it on. And unless he was sadly mistaken, that was just what was waiting inside the magic cupboard. He unlocked the door. Yes, there he was, pinked cheek, tousle-headed under his army cap, his uniform creased and mud-splattered and blood-stained, looking angry, frightened, and bewildered. He rubbed his eyes with his free hand. Praise be for a bit of daylight anyway, he said. What the? Then he opened his eyes and saw Omri. That's Tommy. Forgive my crude attempt at a, you know, a British accent. Omri actually saw him go white, and his knees gave way under him. He uttered a few sounds, half curses, and just half noises. He dropped the bag and hid his face for a moment. Omri said hastily, Please don't be afraid. It's all right. I. And then he had an absolute inspiration. I'm a dream you're having. I won't hurt you. I just want you to do something for me. And then you'll wake up. Slowly, the little man lowered his hands and looked up again. A dream, is it? Well, I should have guessed. Yes, of course. It would be. The whole rotten wall's a nightmare enough. Though without giants and... He stared around Omri's room. Still and all, perhaps it's a a change for the better. At least it's quiet here. Can you bring your bag and climb out? I need your help. The soldier now managed a rather sickly smile and tipped his cap in a sort of salute. Right you are. With you in a tick, he said, and picked up the bag, clambered over the edge of the cupboard. Stand on my hand, Omri commanded. The soldier did not hesitate a moment, but swung himself up by looking by hooking his free arm around Omri's little finger. Bit of lock, this, he remarked. I won't half enjoy telling the fellows about this dream of mine in the trenches tomorrow. Omri carried him to the spot where Little Bear sat holding his leg, which was still bleeding. Remember, in the last chapter, Little Bear got injured. The soldier stepped down and stood, knee-deep in carpet pile, staring. Well, I'll be jiggered, he breathed. A bloomin' Indian. This is a rum dream, and no mistake. And wounded, too. Well, I suppose that's my job, isn't it? To patch him up? Yes, please, said Omri. Without more ado, the soldier put the bag on the floor and snapped open its all but invisible catches. Omri leaned over to see. Now he really did need a magnifying glass, and so badly did he want to see the details of the miniature doctor's bag that he risked sneaking into Gillian's room. Gillian's always slept late, and anyway, it wasn't even seven o'clock yet, and pinching his from his secret drawer. By the time he got back to his room, the soldier was kneeling at Little Bear's feet, applying a tourniquet to the top of the leg. A tourniquet to wrap a bit of cloth around the, the, you know, a, a part, a limb that might be bleeding to cut off the blood flow so it doesn't bleed all out if somebody's cut. So he applied a neat tourniquet to the top of the leg. Omri peered the, through the magnifying glass into the open bag. It was amazing. Everything was there. Bottles, pills, uh, pill boxes, ointments, some steel instruments, including a tiny hypodermic needle, and many rolls of bandages as you could want. Omri then ventured to look at the wound. Yes, it was quite deep. Uh, The horse must have given him a terrific kick. That reminded him. Where was the horse? He looked around in fright, but soon he saw it, trying forlornly to eat the carpet. (laughs) Poor horse. I must get it some grass, thought Omri, Uh, meanwhile offering it a small piece of stale bread, which it ate gratefully, and then some water in a tin lid. It was odd how the horse was not frightened of him. Perhaps it couldn't see him very well. There now, it'll do, said the soldier getting up. Omri looked at the Indian's leg through his magnifying glass. The wound was bandaged beautifully. Even Little Bear was examining it with obvious approval. Thank you very much, said Omri. Would you like to wake up now? Might as well, I suppose. Not that there's much to look at, look forward to, except mud and rats and German shells coming over. Still, got to win the war, haven't we? Can't desert. Even in a dream. Not for long. That is, duty calls and all that, eh? Omri gently picked him up and put him into the cupboard. Goodbye, he said, and perhaps sometime 
you could dream me again. A pleasure, the soldier said the soldier cheerfully. Tommy Atkins at your service. Any night, except when there's an attack. None of us gets any sleep to speak of then. And he gave Omri a smart salute. Regretfully, Omri shut and locked the door. He was tempted to keep the soldier, but it was too complicated just now. Anyway, he could always bring him back to life again if he liked. A moment or two uh, later, he opened the door again to check. There was the orderly, bag in hand, standing just as Ormry had last seen him at the salute. Only now, he was plastic again. Little Bear was calmly pulling on his blood-stained leggings. Good magic, he remarked. Leg feel good. Little Bear, what will you do all day while I'm at school? You bring bark of tree. Little Bear make long house. What's that? Iroquois house. Need earth. Stick posts in. Earth? Posts? Earth. Posts. Bark. Not for not forget food. Weapons. Tools. Pots. Water. Fire. There were no quarrels at breakfast that morning. Omri gulped down his... Uh, just scene changed back to breakfast. Uh, Omri gulped down his egg and ran. In the greenhouse, he found a seed tray already full of soil, well pressed down. He carried that secretly upstairs and laid it on the floor behind the dressing up crate, which he was pretty sure his mother wouldn't shift even if it was her cleaning day. Then he took his penknife and went out again. Fortunately, one of the trees in the garden had a sort of bark that came off easily, a silvery, flaky kind. I wonder what tree that is. Is that uh, maybe a birch or something? Not silvery, but anyway. He cut off a biggish strip, and then another to make sure. How long was a long house? He pulled some grass from the horse. He cut a bundle of thin, strong, straight twigs and stripped off their leaves. Then he went back to his room and laid these uh, offerings beside Little Bear, who was seated outside his teepee, apparently saying his prayers. Omri, came his mother's call from downstairs. Time to go. Omri took out of his pocket the corner of toast he'd saved from breakfast and cleaned out the last of the corned beef from the tin. There was some corn left as well, though it was getting rather dry by now. He filled up Action Man's beaker with water from the bathroom, pouring a little into the horse's drinking lid. The horse was munching the fresh grass with every sign of enjoyment. Omri noticed its bridle had been replaced with a halter, cleverly made of a length of thread. Omri! Just coming! The others have gone. Hurry up. You'll be late. One last thing. Little Bear couldn't make a longhouse without some sort of tool beside his knife. He needed an axe. Frantically, Omri rummaged in the biscuit tin. Ah! A knight wielding a fearsome-looking battle axe. It wasn't right, but it was better than nothing it would have to do. In a second, the knight was locked in the cupboard. Oh, man. Oh. Omri! One second! What are you doing? Crash! The axe was being used on the inside of the cupboard door. Omri wrenched it open, snatched the axe from the startled hands of the knight, who had just time for one horrified look before he was reduced to plastic again by the slamming of the door. Never mind. He had looked most unpleasant, just as knights must have looked when they were murdering the poor Saracens in Palestine. Omri had very little time for knights. The axe was a beauty, though. Shining steel with a sharp edge on both sides of the head and a long, heavy steel handle. Omri laid it at Little Bear's side. Little Bear, he was still in a trance, communicating with his ancestors, Omri supposed. Well, Little Bear would find everything when he came to. There was quite a trail of split earth leading behind the crate. Omri crashed down the stairs. Oh, there was quite a trail of spilt earth leading behind the crate. Omri flat, flashed down the stairs, grabbed his parka and his lunch money, and was gone. That was chapter five. Stay tuned for the next video, which will be chapter six. The chief is dead. Long live the chief. Gee, I wonder what that means. Thanks for reading with me.